So just make sure I got the right Bible reading here. My apologies. All right. Uh, so yes, Bible reading. First Bible reading. Thank you, Cephas. Uh, Isaiah 42, 1 to 9. Oh, I'm sure it's going to come up on the screen behind me, so I better not make any mistakes. All right. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. No? Isaiah, oh, 42. No? I was going, why is everybody laughing at me? I'm in 41, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, there you go. I'm really, really good at this, so thank you. Gotcha. Thank you, hecklers. Uh, the servant of the Lord. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what, the, is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for my people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. And the second reading is from Mark. Let's see if my phone can get this one right. Mark chapter 8. Sorry about this, I'm such a, a, a technology master. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. All right, Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them 
when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly, I tell you, someone, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, it was um, there was a, a, an act of serving. I asked Brian at the last minute to um, read the Bible for us, and so thank you for doing that uh, and serving us in that way. Um, it's also great to have our kids' spot, isn't it? I, I think the kids' spot that's still church, isn't it? It's not. It's still part of who we are and what we do. Um, and I think I've learnt, I know all the actions now to that song we sang today. I think I got through and I wasn't panicking and fumbling around. I knew where we were going. I knew what to do. Did anyone, when we, uh, this is, well, what's the last one where we jump? Did anyone's feet leave the ground? Nah, mine never either. I'm going to practice until I'm, I can feel free to jump in church. Um, I think it's important for our young guys to see us um, embrace them uh, and enjoy the actions with them and the, the part of the song. We're all church and our young guys are part of us and I think the kids spot is us serving our young guys and saying yes this is significant and important part of our service. So that's why we have the kids spot. It's not for them and for us to watch something happening then. That's, they're doing that in Sunday school now. Um, why we have it in church is that they're part of our church. That's not my sermon. Um, my sermon is about the greatness of the kingdom and the greatness of Jesus. And you get the idea as you read the gospel uh, that Jesus wanted us to follow him. Uh, this, that is, he wants us to be part of his kingdom. He's a welcoming king and he wants us to join his kingdom and he goes to great lengths so that we can, although... I just don't think he's very good at marketing. How can the kingdom grow with a slogan that says, come follow me, it will cost you your life? Needs a better slogan, I reckon, if Jesus wants people to join his kingdom. Um, Mark 8, 34. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Doesn't sound that attractive, does it? Come follow me, take up your cross. Um. We could brush over that, but there's other parts in the Bible we could go to. Even in Mark's Gospel, there's other things we could go to. I mean, do you think God really wants you to give up your life? Uh, after all, can't we serve God better uh, if we're happier? So shouldn't I serve myself before I serve others? Um, someone once tried to sell me a car that I couldn't afford. And he, um, in our conversation, bantering, he kind of found out that I was a minister. Uh, and, and he went on to say, he said, he told me, what's the Bible say? The Bible says, look after your own house before you look after others. Um, of course, if that was what Jesus said... We could understand why then people would follow him, you know, because you look after yourself before you look after others. You give people a spare stuff, but it's not. Despite what the false teachers of our day say, he doesn't say that following him will, will give you better business principles or, or uh, more choices or greater wealth. That's not what following Jesus is about. He says, follow me, it will cost you everything you have. If we were to preach the kingdom, if we were to preach Christ, if we were to call people to follow him, we must talk of the cost. To 
to follow Jesus, it will cost you everything. And that might seem too high a price to pay. Unless you come to know the king and his kingdom. When Jesus speaks about bringing in the kingdom of God, his identity, who he is and what he brings about has always been one of the the significant key factors of accepting the kingdom, of understanding the kingdom. Chapter 8 in Mark's gospel is the turning point of his of his account as Marx tells the story uh, he has the reader in mind he has us in mind Mark tells us in the first verse this is the gospel about God's God's king Jesus and his kingdom this is the good news about God's king and his kingdom in the first eight chapters of Mark have been given has been given us a look at, to the, at the king and his kingdom, which includes most of Jesus' earthly life. So we've got, you know, got Mark's account, so it was like this big. Um, chapter 8's kind of in the middle somewhere. And this much has been all of Jesus' life up until uh, this point where he now turns towards Jerusalem and Mark slows down the reader with all this detail as Jesus walks towards Jerusalem and is then butchered on a cross and resurrected. Uh, And so this is the turning point. And at this turning point is this question of identity. Verse 29, who do you say I am? This has been... Uh, answered many ways up until this point. So there's this been, de- been this developing theme or uh, unveiling of Jesus in Mark's account up to this point. Uh, in chapter 1, some unclean spirits had some ideas of who Jesus was. They say he is the Holy One of God. They cry out. And so we as a reader hear these demons calling him the Holy One of God and we think, well, I don't know, can you trust demons? Who is he? Uh, a little further on in the story, uh, in verse 27, those around Jesus asked, by what authority does he do these amazing things that he was doing? Uh, what, it was a question of identity. Who is he that can cast out demons? Who is he that can heal the sick? The scribes answer this by saying, well, he casts out demons because he's, he's from the devil in chapter 3. So you've got, your, you got, your, um, you got your, your unclean spirits who say he's the holy one of God and you've got the, the church leaders saying he's from the devil. Um, and when the disciples see him speak in a boat where there's been tossed around by fierce waves and, and, and storm... And, and, and just by his words, he says, be calm and it is still. They ask the question, who is this? Who is this that speaks and it's all still? Then as he sets towards Jerusalem, the cross Uh, where he'll take upon the cross, he brings up the question of identity again. This time Jesus asks them, he say, first generally, who do people say I am? And there's lots of different responses there. But his real concern is with the disciples, I think. And he asks them, he says, who do you say I am? Peter, now he seems to be the spokesman of the disciples, so you can take it to all the disciples saying this. Um, He says, you're the Christ. He is God's anointed one, that is. God's king who is closely linked to the fulfilment of God's promises made in the Old Testament long ago. He is God's saving king. This is huge. Could you imagine what this would have been like for the disciples to come to this conclusion? You know, so so to believe in God is one thing. Yeah, it's God. Of course there's a God. 
Um, I, to, to believe in his promises. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a God who speaks and there's going to be good things that happen in the future. Like, you know, he'll do stuff eventually. Uh, to, to, to believe in the, that one day in the future he will right the wrongs, it's comforting, it's good. But, you know, it's, uh, this is different. You see, God is acting. This is the day of fulfilled promises. This is the day that the rights are made ro- uh, the wrongs are made right. This is the day that faith is justified. And the one who is going to do it is standing right in front of them. And he's asking them, "Who do you say I am?" And they are saying, "You're it. You're the Messiah, the Christ." the fulfilment of all God has spoken before, and here he is standing in front of them. God is not a theory. He's a God who acts in history. And here he is before them. You're the Christ. They just didn't understand quite what that meant. See, it was common in those days for Jews to to understand the Christ as a a triumphant military figure. See, they had been oppressed by one nation or another, the Jews, for for many, many, many years, and here they are under the Roman Empire. They understood as the Messiah, the Christ, would come with a sword. The kingdom, in their view, would be kind of like, you know, I can imagine it would be like Rome, but bigger and better and were on the winning side. So the Messiah would come in and change it all around so they were the winners. But the Christ speaks of his kingdom. The fact that there is a king, he speaks of his kingdom and Jesus goes on to explain the type of kingdom it is through what the type of Christ he is. They are right in their understanding that Jesus is bringing in God's eternal kingdom. In verse 31, he describes himself there as the son of man, which is an interesting title. It comes from Daniel 7, which we read, that was that long reading we read last week. Daniel 7 talks about the son of man. Um, Daniel prophesies as there's this one who will come in the future. Um, he will, we, he's called the son of man who will bring in God's everlasting kingdom. You see... There'll be kingdoms that come up, empires that come up, and you think there's no way um, anyone is ever going to kind of be bigger than them and then another kingdom comes. And no way no one is ever going to be bigger than them. In the end, this prophecy of Daniel is saying, hey, when the dust settles, when it's all done and dusted and and everything kind of calms down, there's only going to be one kingdom standing. This is the kingdom of God. It's an everlasting kingdom. And it's and, and there was, there's no opposition. It's the only kingdom. It's the only thing standing in the end. And the one who rules it is this son of man. But far from their expectations, Jesus teaches in verse 31, but this son of man is the one who will be rejected by God's priest. That is, the, the guy's high up in the whole God people kind of community they're high up in understanding who God is Uh, but the one who comes will be rejected by them Jesus says and the elders it will come through his death this kingdom that he speaks about that the son of man is the son of man's kingdom it will come through his death and in his life in his resurrection See, Jesus fulfills the prophecy of the Son of Man, but he also fills the prophecy of a prophet named Isaiah, which was, um, Brian read for us a little bit of Isaiah, and it's part of that package where Isaiah um, has these kind of like um, prophecies about this one to come who would bring in God's saving um, uh, salvation. He's like a um, suffering servant, he's known as. Um, One of the famous verses of the suffering servant is um, Isaiah 53. That's made famous by, you know, old Colin Buchanan. 
Um, let me read that for you. I, I've got it up on the screen. Isaiah 53, verse 3. This is Isaiah's prophecy. Um, speaking about the one to come, this suffering servant. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The, pun the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then the passage goes on a bit further. It speaks about um, how he does this. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life, like a resurrection, and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give you him. A, I'll give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with their tr transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Peter looking for a military kingdom military Christ didn't understand that this was God's plan from the very beginning this suffering of the Christ was God's plan it was prophesied about see he didn't understand how great the kingdom was nor what needed to happen to bring it about this was no mere military battle this was God displaying his righteousness and defeating the enemy, defeating sin and the ruler of this world the Christ does not come as a military king but as a suffering servant the one that Isaiah foretold the kingdom is not about a palace, but about God's reign. Christ's victory in his death is seen in his resurrection, where he is raised to rule. You know, the kingdom of God is not just some pie in the sky when you die. When we talk about the kingdom of God, it's not just talking about heaven, pie in the sky when you die. It is an element where, I've heard this before, where it's a steak on your plate while you wait. Um, the kingdom of God is now. For Christ's rule is now. He died and was resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the Father. God is ruling, Christ is ruling now. The kingdom has come. Not all is revealed as it will be, but the kingdom has come. This, why, this is why everyone needs to give an account of their life before him. He is king and presently ruling. The kingdom has come because he has died and has risen. And that's why he says in chapter 9 verse 1, I tell you the truth, some of you standing here will not taste death before you see the kingdom of God come in power. Talking about his disciples 2,000 years ago, talking to them, and um, they have since died. You know and, uh, but he was telling, talking to them and saying you'll see the kingdom come you'll see me ascended you'll see me take my place at the right hand of the father the kingdom has come and why is this important for us to understand this it's important because Jesus invites us into his kingdom now he says follow me and he's asking us 
to follow him is to take up our cross. And this is a big call. What he's saying is Jesus is asking us for a complete abandonment of ourselves and a total trust in him. Salvation is always grace. It's always what Christ has done. But it is trust. It's a relationship. It's an abandonment of the self and a trust in him. It makes no sense to follow him and that is to trust in him in such a way, to such an extent, unless you're convinced of who he is, that he is the Christ and that through his suffering, through his cross, he has brought in God's everlasting kingdom. If you're not convinced of that, how could you trust him to the level he's calling us to? The kingdom will one day be revealed in all all its splendour. The blind will one day see. The lame will walk. There will be no more death, crying or pain. What Jesus accomplished through his suffering, you see, it was of cosmic scale. And it's bigger than Rome. It's bigger than all we know and see. He brings in God's kingdom. And as we understand the king and his kingdom, abandoning ourselves, taking up our cross, then makes so much more sense. Verse 35 of chapter 8, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. There is nothing you can, uh, you can offer God to redeem yourself from the punishment that you deserve, that I deserve. There's nothing we can do. You want to save your life, you want to get busy saving your life, you'll lose it. Because there's only one salvation and that's through what Jesus has done. And if you don't know that salvation, if you're not sure if you have that salvation, um, talk to me today. Because Jesus has done it all. You can't save your life. If you try to, you'll lose it. But the verse goes on. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus offers us a place in his kingdom, his eternal kingdom. Verse 36 goes on and says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Um, You've probably heard of a missionary called Jim Elliott. Um, Jim Elliott, uh, he was a missionary in Ecuador. Um, I've forgotten the details, but basically I think he went over there without his wife in this kind of stint. uh, And he was, um, as he was trying to share the gospel with uh, the people of Ecuador, he was actually killed for his uh, uh, attempts. Um, They gathered his stuff and... You know, brought it back to his wife and she found his diary as she was going through his things and started reading his diary and just a couple of weeks before uh, he was killed uh, he penned this in his diary um, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which will last forever it's a pretty good line, isn't it? A pretty logical line. He's no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which will last forever. Jesus' kingdom goes on beyond what we can see. His kingdom is greater than we can imagine. His kingdom encompasses death, but he embraces life. Jesus is saying here that if you follow me, it will cost It will cost maybe in a relationship, a career, popularity, success in many of the ways the world recognises success. To follow him will cost. But this taking up your cross, this total abandonment of self and trust in Jesus... 
is more than just focusing op fo facing opposition of the world around us. Um, taking up my cross means I die to my self-centred desires that dominate my life and leave me empty. It's a daily wrestle, taking up your cross, isn't it? Uh, I die to the passions to want more and more. Uh, really, these passions leave me with still not having enough. I die to the need to show everyone how important I am, how significant I am, and the desperate longing to be known to have done something. You see, the interesting thing in dying to self, I actually don't lose myself or life. I gain life. It's as I trust in Jesus in all he has done, as I abandon myself, I actually find life. I find who I am. I find life where I'm known by my God. So I don't have to prove my worth to others. I'm his child, sealed by the blood of Jesus, and no one can shake that identity I have. I gain life that understands contentment because everything I desire is in him. And I, 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 I find life with purpose because of the hope of those treasured possessions that will last for all eternity. I gain life where the peace of knowing the, our Lord is far greater than anything I might collect or gather. It easily impresses people, the world. I gain life where I lose all fear of man and what people can do to me as I put my trust in the sovereign God and his eternal plan. I gain life where I'm secure knowing that he holds me in the palm of his hands. Life that is significant because it's eternal. Life where I know my king and so I speak the goodness of the kingdom to all who will listen. Life with purpose because I know uh, his plans are true. Life where people directing people to my saviour seems the most wonderful, purposeful thing in life I can be part of. You see... He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which will last forever. Jesus calls us to take up our cross. This is not a, uh, a call to works-based faith. It's always grace. But it's how I live who I am in Christ. I daily wrestle to take up my cross. And we can do this because who it is that calls us to follow him. He is Jesus, the Christ, the one who went to the cross and brought my salvation, the one whose kingdom has come and whose kingdom will last for all eternity. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your grace upon us in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you uh, that he took up his cross that we might be known as your children and part of your eternal kingdom. Lord, we pray that you'll help us with our wrestles within and our wrestles with the world uh, that we might daily take up our cross that we might abandon ourselves so that we might find ourselves in you, our hope, our glory. Amen. Well, he is our vision, uh, he is our hope, and so we sing his praises.